Have you ever noticed that the most illuminating experiences in life are also the most humbling? It's precisely when we're tested that we make the intellectual and moral jumps that we need to progress. So I say bring them on. One of the biggest faults of Flash in my life was when I met the woman making pressed yogurt in the West Bank of the Jordan River. I'll call her Leila. I was an engineer sent out by an international organization to teach people how to save water, something I knew very little about. I mean, I was a civil engineer taught by people who thought we could conquer nature with a little bit of physics and a lot of concrete. She, Leila, was about the same age as my sweet mother, and she was training the yogurt in a cloth bag and catching the drip, drip drops into a plastic bucket. And she explained to me that water was so precious that she had to save this for her chicken so that she could feed her family. She was caring for every drop. And I did not get to teach her. I could see that she had no pipe water supply, so I asked her why she didn't just catch the rain. And she explained to me that her sons had once spent two weeks channeling the earth uh, so that the rain would fall into an underground cistern from which her goats could drink in the dry summer months. But then, the soldiers of the occupying army, the men with the guns, as she called them, came and destroyed it overnight. Being Palestinian, she had very few rights in her own land. She wasn't even allowed to collect the rain. And the ball flashed me three times that day. The first was to show the true value of water. The second, to show that you can use it for the service of other people. And the third revealed to me that not everyone values and uses it the same way as Leila does. And I've been thinking about that ever since. I've gone on to become a water policy analyst. I advise on negotiations over international rivers in the Middle East. I teach water security to university students. I've helped build the most complex water treatment plants in the safest of places, and some very basic tax stands in some very hairy war zones. I can do as much as I can, and I generally try to get people excited about water at every turn. I do think about other things, like... No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, pity or envy my seven-year-old son then, who gets to go to water treatment plants when he's made for a theme parks. Or my wife, who gets pulled away from the art and architecture of the palaces we visit to the center of the courtyard where the well is. <laughs> What drives me is the inspiration I see, I get every time I see water, not least of all, the reflection of willows on a river. It could be very different for you. It could be the smell of a rose garden after a gentle rain. It could be the energy that's sensed at the confluence of two rivers, so holy in so many different religions. It could be the relief that's felt after the monsoon breaks the heat. Or the way that springs attract water collectors like hummingbirds to a feeder. Or it could be the drip, drip, dripping of rain falling off a green leaf into a puddle. These are all outward expressions of water's inner grace. And what makes it so different from oil or diamonds or other natural resources. What really fascinates me is the lengths that we go to to, to destroy that inner grace. And water can nourish, right? It stimulates life, growth, thought, poetry, dance. But, and as a comedian Gil Stern says, man is a strange creature. He makes deserts bloom and lakes die. Water can also cleanse, keeping us all healthy, sentient, and creative. But we pollute rivers only to have to clean them up again before we drink from them, instead of not polluting them in the first place. And water can unify because it connects and is available to us all. But we let it divide us between the haves and the have-nots, between the powerful and the less powerful. So instead of nourishing, cleansing, and unifying, we let water starve, contaminate, and divide. It's going to take a heck of a situation, a heck of a fight to turn this situation around. And that's why I'm here tonight, to enlist you to fight the war for water's inner grace to restore water's nourishing, unifying, and cleansing properties. I think there are two battles to be fought in this war. The first is our unquenchable thirst, and the second is our destructive use of water. I'll take each one of those in turn. 
One of the reasons that I think we use too much water, we have this unquenchable thirst, is because we don't really understand where it comes from, or where it goes. I don't have any slides, so I'll ask you to picture in your head that diagram that you were taught when you were six years old of the hydro cycle. You know the one. The river, the rain falling onto the mountains, down into the river, out to the sea, these great big arrows bringing back up into the clouds again. Yeah. Water has been circulating in this cycle around for thousands of years. And it's what connects us to everything that has ever lived, with every drink we take and with every breath you take. My son nails down the importance of this when he says, it means we drink dinosaur pee every day. <laughs> now I'd like you to picture a triceratops whizzing on the foot of a T-Rex. <laughs> Then we drop these big labels on it, on that diagram. Evaporation, transpiration, precipitation. And we try to explain it or teach it to the kids rather idiotically with ever faster and tighter hand circles. And there, of course the kids retain none of it. And the net result is we don't think about where our water comes from. We don't really know where it comes from or where it goes. Now bless the water workers of the world to get water to our taps 24-7, 365 days a year. At least those of us lucky to have that service, that secure supply. But I've noticed the more that our supply is secure, the more we take water for granted. And the more we take water for granted, the more we allow it to be valued solely in economic terms, like any other object or commodity. The way mutton was once sheep, or the way that lumber was once a forest, could be priced and sold on the open market. And that's when water can get really, that's when our thirst can get really unquenchable. I'll give you an example. Does anybody know where asparagus, the asparagus that we consume here in the UK comes from? I mean, outside of April to May, when we grow it ourselves? That's right, in Peru. From the Juanita Valley in Peru, one of the driest places on the planet. Growers there use drip irrigation to apply exactly the right amount of water at the right spot at the right time. 3,600 Olympic-sized swimming pools every year just to satisfy the, the demand, for, our demand for asparagus in the driest place on the planet. And the asparagus is then wrapped in plastic and styrofoam, shipped across two continents, and delivered to our local store. Now, it's an extremely lucrative business. You get... Yes, so it's so lucrative, in fact, that the, when the groundwater levels came, went out of reach of the, of the pumps, the growers simply diverted the headwaters of the Amazon River to continue feeding our, our hunger, or our thirst, the two are very closely related, instead of using the water within sustainable limits. And what's going on here is that the, the growers are getting more crops per drop. Indeed, as the great water thinker Tony Allen says, they're getting more dollars per drop. But what we're not doing is safeguarding the environment, or even spreading the benefits of it around in any sort of equitable way. We've had Mother Nature on the run for over a century now, and the best that we can come up with are these hyper-efficient systems that benefit only those who can afford it. If pricing water was to lead to any sort of equitable distribution of water, then there wouldn't be hundreds of millions of people without a secure supply. And just last month, the World Bank released a report that said it would cost $30 billion to get a secure supply to everybody on the planet. Sounds like a lot of money, but it's actually about the same price cost as the annual defense budget of Italy. And the other problem with having water valued solely in economic terms is that, terms is that you can turn it, the tax off to people who can't pay for it. Look at the city of Detroit, which turned the tax off on its own residents to thousands of people just because they didn't pay their water bills. That wouldn't happen in this country, because people have fought for the right to water. The government's not allowed to turn your tax off if you don't pay your water bills. But it's not a right that we can take for granted.
What if we were to turn off the taps for even crueler reasons? Which brings me to this, the second trend that we have to reverse, the destructive use of water. I don't know about you, but I've heard the phrase, water is life, with such monotonous regularity that if I hear it one more time, I'm going to lose my hair. <laughs> I'm not even sure water really is life anyway, because it doesn't square with what I've seen working in conflict zones. I've seen water used as a tool of war. Consider water can be death, too. Consider the snipers who wait by the tap stands that we built for the women to come and collect the water, like coming birds to a feeder. Just as cowardly are some of the military lawyers who from so far away are pressured to bend the rules of war to allow more collateral damage when their armies strike into heavily populated civilian areas. And we established the rules of war to try to limit the amount of damage and pain that men can inflict upon each other. They're pretty important. Collateral damage, more collateral damage, means more damage treatment plans and more wounded children. In the former Yugoslavia, the men with the guns would dump the bodies of the people they killed down in the backyard well. It's an extremely effective tactic if you want to clear the killing fields, or if you want the population to never return, throwing grandfather down the family water source. It's an image I'd like you to hold in your mind just long enough to spur you into action. At this point, water is indeed cleansing, but in the darkest and most cynical sense of the word, to favor one ethnicity over another. Meanwhile, back in the West Bank, Palestinians are still collecting, some Palestinians are still collecting water from springs and bringing it back home on donkeys. And the pipes that are laid down are to support the settlements for the people that are colonizing their land. So are you with me? Do you want water to be available to the marginalized as much as it is to yourself? Yes. Do you want to stop the ethnic snipers, sorry, the ethnic cleansers and the snipers? Yes. Do you want the drip, drip, dripping to remind you not of torture and misery, but of rain falling off a green leaf into a puddle? Yes. Then join the war for water, the war to restore water's inner grace. We're going to need a lot less detachment from the rain, a lot more con connection with the rain a lot less greed per gallon, and a lot more compassion per cup. Remember, this is a hard-nosed engineer telling you this. <laughs> and we're we'll helping use every little bit of influence that we have. And here we can take inspiration from people like Leila and other unsung heroes. So raise a glass then to all the public lawyers who are forensically documenting the effects of armed conflict on water systems so that the targeters cannot say that they did not know. And here's to all the water workers in the world. The men and women risking the sniper's crosshairs just to fulfill their duty to get to clean water. Hundreds of them have paid the ultimate price for their duty. Some of them my friends. And thanks to all the activists who are fighting for the right to water around the world, so that no one can turn the taps off just because you can't afford it. Without them, the pursuit of ever more dollars per drop would lead to its logical conclusion. Water for the wealthy, sewage for the slums. But mostly due recognition for all the people who are fighting a war for water every day. To the father in the favela who's treating dirty water through a cloth filter. To the mother who leaves the village for miles to collect water to the people on the fringes of our society who are pushing against unchecked economic growth through a greater connection with the rain. These are the people to be inspired by. And then it's up to you, all of you, all of us, to act, to buck the trends, to take those risks of humiliating and humbling experiences, to push the social and technological frontiers, to make those decisions, to be those parents, to be the rain. More specifically, to support international water law and the right to water, to 
become a river keeper to support the principles of the World Commission on Dam to explore the fourth phase of water. To help that kid who connects water with dinosaur pee today be the person who makes water available for people he doesn't even know yet tomorrow. To resist and to fight the war for water with every breath you take. Thank you very much.